Good afternoon and welcome. This is Daniel Bornstein. It's my pleasure to be here and it's my pleasure to uh, conduct a afternoon webinar on the best practices in property management. This is a very apropos uh, subject because with the realities of the market throughout California, but especially in the Bay Area, it is absolutely important for you as a real estate investor, as a housing provider, as someone in the real estate industry to understand how I look at effective management and what are the core components of effective management that will put your management team into a position where you have excellence as opposed to mediocrity. And it is always a work in progress, but when you have an opportunity to get in a matter of 45 minutes to an hour, a review of how I see effective management and where are the pitfalls, I think you're gonna be very happy that you stayed attentive during this webinar and you've got a working knowledge of one window of how management is seen and what are the best practices that you can expect from a property management company to help maximize returns on your real estate investment, as well as simultaneously reducing risk of liability. And that's tricky. So with that stated, uh, I'm Daniel Bornstein. I've been a uh, practicing attorney for uh, over three decades. I'm also a real estate investor a broker and a broker of record for Bay Property Group that is a full service property management brokerage uh, in the Bay Area. Most importantly today is I'm going to focus on what I think is the outstanding ways in which you as maybe a property manager or you who is considering property management for your real estate investment, what are the core issues that you should be familiar with so you can evaluate a management company effectively? So with that stated, again, Daniel Bornstein, let's uh, jump in and uh, fasten your seat belts. I think this will be a very helpful process for all of you. So what do we have now in the Bay Area? When you are a manager, of a property, your goal is to maximize value for your client while also making sure that the physical aspect of the property is kept in good shape and also minimizing risk of potential harm or liability that may arise by having people inside the unit. With softening rents throughout the Bay Area, increasing operational costs such as increasing PG&E bills and other utility costs, Additional regulations that are being imposed by the state of California by federal law, the proliferation of lawsuits arising from proactive tenant attorneys, you've got yourself a real significant challenge to be effective as a manager and or just as a real estate investor. One core aspect of this is always how can we locate and retain outstanding tenants because at the core of a real estate investment is typically consistent, excellent cash flow emanating from the property, typically cash flow that covers the operating cost of that real estate investment. With softening rents and additional costs and additional regulations post COVID and the further impact of local rent control, just cause eviction rules, we've got ourselves a recipe for a straitjacket that impacts the ability to actually make money in your real estate. Not to say that many of us are suffering with increased interest payments on mortgages and increased litigation, insurance companies leaving California. So we are in a crisis and the goal is even if we are in a crisis we still have to make great decisions about our real estate investments so with that let's go to the next slide there are three components of outstanding property management one excellent communication with tenants 
where you have a property management company that is not communicating with tenants, it creates frustration. You wanna have a property management company that is available 24 seven for tenant emergencies, whether it's an answering service or some approach available to a tenant if there is a crisis in the building. The easy answer is a catastrophic fire, an earthquake, or some sort of flood that occurs at night, you wanna be able to at least have that responsiveness. Excellent bookkeeping. You wanna make sure that every month there is proper documentation of what expenses are being generated, what cash flow is coming in, what is the revenue, and what at any point in time you're able to see an account statement and be able to understand what you're being charged with, what bills are being paid, and what rent is either coming in or hasn't come in. And that bookkeeping is a core component of excellent property management. And then in California especially, the knowledge of the law is essential. So you may find a charismatic real estate agent who has great communications because they're dynamic in their communication, and they have a good accountant, but they simply don't understand the law. And the law keeps getting more and more complex. And one third of property management at this point in time, at this snapshot in the Bay Area, is excellent knowledge of the law. And when we talk about knowledge of the law, there's both the state ordinance, state provisions, and local provisions. And then you have to ask yourself, when was your property built? Is it a single family home? Is it a condominium unit? Is it a multi-unit property? Is it a single family home with an ADU? There are so many different iterations and so many different rules and regulations that you have to be familiar with. You really want to hone in with your selection of a property manager or a management company and say, how many 10 unit properties do you manage? Do you manage a duplex? Do you manage a single family home with an in-law unit? What's your understanding of Oakland rent control or Oakland just cause eviction laws if you have a property in Oakland? What's your familiar where, familiarity with the rent registry in San Francisco? If you don't register the unit, what will happen? No manager is going to have a 100% understanding of the law. What they should have is core relationships with attorneys that can help you get to that answer. And they want to be at least familiar with the law to insulate you from the risk of a poor decision by an agent who is simply adept at communication, but ignorant about what needs to happen in the event that there is some sort of habitability issue, mold issue, sublet issue, pet issue, emotional support animal. There are so many litany of questions, including section eight or what have you, that you have to have a working knowledge of the law. And remember, there are some management companies that do a lot of sales and they don't necessarily have a core competency in management. And you wanna make sure that who you select for management is doing management in that locale all the time, that they have a portfolio committed to that locale so that they're familiar with the law. For instance, Emeryville. Emeryville has an ordinance. It has its own regulations. If we look at Concord, California, they imposed a rent ordinance and then they backed it back. If you're not aware of these sort of iterations or back and forth steps, you're going to be compromised in your effective management because you simply are dangerous without a working knowledge of the law. So those are the three critical comp components of good property management. And property management starts at the inception of the relationship. It's not after the tenant is in, it's at the inception, and we'll talk about tenant selection practices, maximizing rent income, but really the whole sum total of management starts first at the inception of the relationship between the housing provider and the management company, the vacant unit, the marketing of the unit, the tenant selection, and then the documentation to establish the tenancy including proper move-in forms, documentation of the condition of the unit. And if your agent simply doesn't have these documents available or is unfamiliar with the process, they are likely not the agent you want handling your property. For example, many of you don't know, but as of 
July 2024, there's a new law coming into place regarding security deposits. I would venture to guess if you talk to 20 property managers, maybe four would know, 20% maybe would know that there's a new law coming into effect regarding security deposits. Pre-July of 2024, we hopefully know that a vacant unit, you can have up to two months of the equivalent of rent per security deposit. If it's a furnished unit, you can have up to three months rent. Starting in July of 2024, what we have is this chart. Let's go through it. The general rule is if you have a landlord who's a natural person, the first question you ask is, does the landlord own more than two residential properties that collectively include more than four dwelling units? If the answer is no, is the tenant actively serving in the military? No, then you can have a security deposit of no more than two months rent. So it's really small property owners, two months of rent. Larger property owners who have more than four dwelling units, we're looking at security deposits of no more than one month's rent. So if you have a corporation that owns property, if you have an LLC that members are actually other entities, one month security deposit. And remember, with active military, it's always going to be one month of the security deposit. I will guess that come July, there will be property management companies, there will be property managers, there will be owners still requesting two months rent, despite the fact that they own a sixplex, despite the plaques that they own 10 units, or they own a triplex and a duplex, and they don't realize as a result of owning five units, they're only allowed to ask for one month's rent. Now, if you currently have a tenant in your unit and you've received a security deposit of two months rent, do not worry. You do not have to give back the security deposit of one month because this law is coming into effect in July. The more important thing for me is to demonstrate a very simple explanation or an example of if your management company is not staying informed of the law, they may not even know of this new change to the law. For you in the real estate industry, your job is to stay abreast of the law and I wanna congratulate you for coming to this seminar or webinar because you got my email. And that means you're receiving information about updates to the law through my office. And I invite you to also affiliate with other people who are interested in real estate and to the extent that they would very much like to be informed, give me their email. I welcome inviting others to learn. It's my privilege to be able to educate people and to provide a window of knowledge as to what I think is the best approach to the selection of a property management company or just generalized knowledge that I give on a recurring weekly basis, updating people about what's happening and what is trending in California with a particular emphasis on the Bay Area where I'm located. And I do have offices in Oakland and in San Francisco, and we do manage approximately 800 units throughout the Bay Area. Now, let's talk about accounting. Accounting is critical. And what we need to know is when you talk to a property management company, you want to say, hey, what software package are you using for management? Typically, it may be Yardi or it may be a folio. If they're using a software program that you're not familiar with, you should ask, what software program are you using? How do you handle accounting? Is it a internal software system or is it cloud-based? What you wanna make sure of is that the reports are detailed, there is clarity on a monthly basis, you've got year-end statements available to you for tax basis, and that monthly payments are being made recurring so that you can be confident that your revenue, your profit and loss, and anything about the economy of your real estate investment is being dealt with by the property management company effectively. 
and access to custom reports if necessary under certain situations. Now, admittedly, if you own a single family home, the likelihood of needing custom reports is atypical. But if you're owning a 25 unit to 100 unit apartment complex, that's a totally different story. What you wanna make sure of is that the information is available and you're not working with someone who is using a handwritten balance statement or a handwritten ledger because they're still practicing 1950s accounting despite the fact that we're in 2024. And I also wanna mention this, if you have self-selected into managing your own property, some of these software accounting programs are perfectly available for you to utilize. And that's something you ought to consider because as I talk about management, I'm also asking you pointedly, are your systems in place that you're organized? I can't tell you how many times as an attorney, I ask people to provide me a tenant rent ledger because they want me to proceed with a non-payment of rent eviction. And the ledger comes in on handwritten notes. There is no documentation that is computerized or data-driven, and that is a potential Achilles heel for a lot of people. So as you take this webinar, think about your own practices if you don't engage management and whether it makes sense for you to up your game. And I invite anybody on this webinar, if you need assistance in upping your game, I can healthfully help you get to the right place so you can professionalize yourself or self-select into professional management, but the accounting issue is core. And remember, the accounting issue is core because it helps when you go to file your taxes. It helps when you establish a non-payment of rent case. Your ledgers need to be great and you should be able to, with the management company, ask for a snapshot of your business and be able to get emailed documentation so you can take a snapshot of what's going on with your property in real time. That doesn't mean you're gonna get uh, reports every two weeks. It may be once a month as you are on that monthly cycle. The most important thing, it's understandable digestible, and if you do have questions, the management company is able to point you to the accounting department, and they're able to answer your questions in a coherent, organized manner that answers the questions you have posed in a manner that is satisfactory to you. The relationship between a client and a property manager is a fiduciary relationship, the highest relationship of utmost care, Disclosure, transparency, honesty, ethical behavior. And if you are feeling compromised in that relationship, talk to me. I'm happy to figure out whether you just have a miscommunication or whether there is a core failure in the relationship. And I will tell you, having practiced law for 30 years as a landlord attorney, I often have clients come to me and they're frustrated with their management company and I look at some of the documentation and I'm astonished at the failure of the management and astonished at the lack of good documentation, the confusion, and I can only say I wish you had come to me earlier because I would have been forthright and suggested you consider changing your management company because they're failing you in core responsibilities. Talked about accounting. Now there's another part of management, which is continuing to make sure the building's physical status is in good condition. And if it's not addressing it, we have the added concern that if you have habitability violations where you're receiving rent by a tenant and the tenant is complaining about conditions existing at the property, there is an effective protocol that's being followed so that there's an investigation, there's a determination as to whether the request for repair is reasonable, and we have written documentation that there's a responsiveness so that if there is ever an injury that occurs at the property, you have documented that there was an effective response at best. And remember, if you're in, the real estate industry, 
as a housing provider, the likelihood is you will have a dispute at some point in your professional career. It can be as simple as a security deposit accounting dispute. It can be a mold related issue. It can be a breach of contract lease issue, but you're likely to have a dispute. It's part of this business. But if you're having a property management company help you in managing your property, you really do want to expect responsiveness to repair requests. If repair request by a tenant is unreasonable, documentation as to why it's unreasonable. An online answering service or an email communication responsibility so that if a tenant has a request, it gets dealt with in an effective way. Notification to effectuate repairs. Where we have a difficult tenant, we want to post the 24-hour notice. We want to make sure the documentation is consistent with the law. And then if we've got a situation where we're not intermittently watching the building, we could have deterioration of the physical aspect of the building because there isn't a program where we have inspections on a yearly or bi-yearly basis to check if there's any outlier condition inside the building that poses a risk to the physical quality of that building. If we do have a significant repair, and this winter, because of the rainfall, of course I've dealt with water intrusion issues. Of course, as a result of the water intrusion issues, I have mold claims. This is client life. This is a building life. I have water intrusion at the windows. I have tenants not ventilating. If I need a major repair, a property management company needs to have a working understanding of whether the tenant can remain in the unit, whether the property can remain in the unit, and whether we need to take the necessary steps to temporarily displace the tenant so you complete the repairs. It's certainly not a fun engagement, but you've got to be careful and it can cascade into tremendous amounts of liability for you. For example, you have a need to do a repair and your property manager, because they don't want to deal with displacement of the tenant, suggests that the tenant can remain in the unit. The unit requires not only a cleaning of the mold, but also a pulling out of some of the drywall. And this is a building built in the 1950s in San Francisco. When the drywall is being cut out, paint is being displaced, and all of a sudden in the environment, you have dust from the paint coming upon the property of the tenant's possessions, the couch, the furnishings, there's dust all over. Guess what? The tenant feels uncomfortable about the level of dust inside the unit and gets the dust tested for the presence of lead. It is demonstrated that lead is in that dust because it was lead paint. The tenant has a young child. They go to a doctor and get a blood test and there's heightened levels of lead in that child's blood. Do we have significant egregious liability? Yes. So a simple job of a drywall replacement with a paint job creates all sorts of risk and your property management company did not recognize it and expose yourself to greater liability. Plaintiff attorney, tenant attorney files a lawsuit and of course, the owner is sued and the property management company is sued as well. And depending upon your property management agreement, you may have to indemnify the property management company unless there was gross negligence by the property management company. Most importantly, your management company needs to be able to see past the horizon of a renovation project and understand where the risk components are in order to insulate you from the risk of liability. Not easy, but that's why you want a management company with expertise so you alleviate and reduce that risk. Let's move on. Now, selection of tenants. I can only tell you this. I am acclimated to hearing problems all day long, failed relationships all day long because people are calling me not because things are going well. They're often calling me because things have broken down in my legal practice. And generally speaking, the selection of a tenant is absolutely the biggest decision you have to make, and it's fraught with risk. We use, of course, 
technology to identify which tenants will likely be seen and demonstrate a level of excellence and integrity in their history as a tenant, in their history as a financial contributor to the economy, as someone who has good credit, as someone who pays their bill on time, who's someone who is employable and has cash flow enough to cover the rent. But I will tell you, that's only one aspect of an assessment. And I will say this, the greatest predictor of dysfunction that will occur in your rental unit is a history of prior dysfunction by that individual applicant, which means if you don't do an outstanding job, a background check, calling professional references, calling personal references, calling your landlord references to assess the history of this individual, you risk putting someone in who may be wonderful from an economic standpoint, but their personality is something that is toxic and caustic. And sometimes someone looks good on paper and then you meet them and they're absolutely a bull in a china shop. And sometimes someone on paper doesn't look ideal, but they present themselves phenomenal. And then we have, unfortunately, the psychopath who is excellent at managing first impressions. And you love the nature of this person because their first impression is outstanding. And you glean past the fact that you can't get a hold of their landlord reference. You glean past or ignore that you never were able to get in contact with their employers. And because they're so dynamic on that first impression, you accept cash, sign a lease agreement with them and put them in. And the following month, May, they stop paying you rent. You've got to be very careful about this. A property management company has to recognize that the choice to bring in a tenant is the biggest choice because once you give people keys and open up that door, typically the only way to get them out is through the court process, which then is an expensive, time-consuming, stressful process, and you want to avoid that at the front end. People come to me, they had a failed relationship, and I asked them how significant did they engage in the selection process, and they say, well, I was vulnerable, the unit was vacant for three or four months, and someone came to me from a friend of a friend, and I let them in, and now I've got a disaster. I can only say to you this, be careful, your property management company has to be excellent in this, and one outlier for Bay Property Group is if we place a tenant in a unit and that tenant ends up not paying the rent, we do offer what we call a no legal fee guarantee, which we will help remove that tenant from the premises if they don't pay the rent and we were responsible for selecting or recommending that tenant in the unit. Now, let's get into particulars, right? We wanna know the quality of the tenant and everything that's happening in California and throughout the country is an attempt to try to preclude you from knowing all about that tenant in order to ensure that people who have a background that is problematic are still able to secure housing because public policy wise, we have a housing crisis and people with criminal backgrounds typically have high incidence of homelessness and so there's a goal often from a public policy perspective to try to mute the ability to learn about their background. So in some jurisdictions, you're not in, in fact allowed to conduct a criminal background check. For most people, you think, well, I need to know if someone has a violent past. And oftentimes you may not be able to get the criminal background. I will say the best approach is to contact landlord references and really drill down on how long this person has been in a unit, did they pose issues? And if you can't get a history of a landlord reference for 10 years, knowing where they were, well, their hole in their landlord reference may very well be they spent some time in prison or they were living with family members because they simply couldn't qualify for a rental unit. We have the experience and expertise to actually sniff this out 
but there are many new rules and regulations as well. For instance, and I've been teaching this, many people don't know. Right now, if a tenant is already secured a commitment by Section 8 for a subsidy, you're not allowed if a tenant says, I'm applying for your rental unit and I have a subsidy from Section 8, the San Francisco Housing Authority, you're not allowed to say, I'm sorry, we don't participate in the Section 8 program. If you do that, you create liability for yourself. If you post an ad on Craigslist and it says, no Section 8, you've got liability. There are management companies and managers who still don't know that rule. And there is a person in the East Bay who is actively suing people by having tenant testers call up, apply for a, applicate for a unit saying, I have a voucher and the owner says, I'm sorry, I don't accept Section 8. And then three days later, a letter comes demanding payment for a violation of the law. You have to be very careful. Where we have someone who is eligible or has a voucher and their rent is $1,000 or you're advertising rent at $1,000 a month and they have a voucher equivalent to $800 a month, what you're allowed to do is inquire as to how they're going to be able to pay the $200 a month. Do they have sufficient savings? Do they have a job? So you have to look at that payment that they will be responsible for paying and in some respects, ignore the $800. The $800 is already a credible payment. And so your inquiry is, do they have stable, verifiable income or savings to justify your ability to accept and expect that $200 consistent payment? It can be very tricky. Most importantly, familiarize yourself with the law. Call my office, I'll be happy to explain it in detail, but if you're working with a property management company, they've gotta know to be careful about this issue because it is new law, and whenever there is new law, there's tons of people who are simply not aware or familiar with it, and they end up violating the law, creating liability for you. And remember, if your management company does something in conflict or contrary to the law, you get sued with your management company, they're your agent. The principal has liability for the negligence of their agents. Leases, I can't emphasize enough. If you're using an old lease, you're creating risk for yourself. Right now I'm dealing repeatedly with people who have 2019 leases on single family homes and condominium units, and there's no notification of exemption from state rent regulation and state just cause eviction rules, the client calls me up and says, Mr. Bornstein, I wanna do a more than 10% increase. It's well below market and I say, send me the lease agreement. And I look, it's a 2018 lease and they never sent the notice of exemption. Many property management companies are not familiar with the requirement to uh, send out notice of exemption on their existing portfolio or they're using an old lease agreement. You need to make sure you're using the most up-to-date lease, not a 2000 lease, not a 2022 lease, a 2024 lease that has been blessed by an industry. It's that tricky. Every year there's a new law, and every time there's a new law, the industry groups revise their lease agreements to address the new law. Many of you love your father or mother who got into real estate in the 1970s and they're, you're thrilled to use their old lease because it always worked and they were so successful and you're so proud of them that every time you engage with their lease, you have nostalgia for your parent and a tear comes into your eye and you feel so proud of being affiliated with such wonderful people. Well, you're getting yourself in trouble. And I would say to you this, if you're selecting a property management company, yes, you have to say to them, what leases are you using? Can I see an example of it? And if you look at the copyright, and the copyright is 2018, run. It's not the appropriate lease. We want to make sure you're not using a no low press lease. We want to make sure that you're using a lease that's appropriate for your locale. A San Francisco lease agreement will be a different lease agreement than a Oakland lease agreement. 
a Berkeley lease agreement will look different than an Oakland lease agreement, depending upon the jurisdictions. Another point, when I started practicing law, there were about three jurisdictions with the rent ordinance. In the Bay Area, there's now 14. And if you're not subject to the individual local ordinance, you're subject to the state ordinance. It is so tricky so that, for instance, and I repeated myself before, if you are selecting a property management company, your property management company should be working in that jurisdiction already. So you wanna say, do you have properties in Berkeley? Are you managing Berkeley? Are you familiar with the Berkeley rent ordinance? And if they say kind of, you have to say, why is it kind of and why is it not for sure? Because if you don't have a management company that's familiar with the local ordinance, you're making yourself at risk of that lack of knowledge. If your management company doesn't know about registrations and registering units in the various jurisdictions, you're creating liability for yourself. And remember, it's your job to make a good decision about who you're working with, and you do that by due diligence, by phone call, by interview, by looking at the documents and feeling comfortable and confident that they have the knowledge necessary to serve you in that capacity as a manager. I wanna also mention this, if you have property, I have property management companies that are my clients, they're wonderful. And some of them have made the decision not to serve notices. So I have one large client uh, who will not prepare their own three-day notices to pay rent or quit. I congratulate them on that decision because it's very complex and tricky. They have my office prepare the three-day notice to pay rent or quit, and they do it for a reason, because it's so tricky, and if you prepare a notice incorrectly, you lose your case. So there are some management companies that are still pulling three-day notices to pay rent or quit off the internet, thinking that they're being successful and don't know that they're creating liability for you. Or they're using a three-day notice that they got from the California Apartment Association and they're using it for Hayward, San Leandro, Berkeley, Oakland, Emeryville, San Francisco, and they don't realize that each location may have a different verbiage in the notice that must be included in order to be compliant. And what happens often is a management company will come to me and say, Mr. Bornstein, we served a three-day notice. The tenant did not pay. Please start the eviction process. I say, send me the lease, the tenant ledger, and the three-day notice and the proof of service. And the first thing I realize is that the notice is no good. And then I have to tell the property management company and the client, I'm sorry, but we have to reserve the three-day notice. I do so always diplomatically, but it would have been so much easier if when there was a failure to pay the rent, the management company contacted my office and asked me to draft up the notice for them so that we can do it effectively and properly. And these notices change. Post-COVID notices are different than pre-COVID notices. The law changed three or four different times during COVID, and we're still dealing with the residue of COVID-related rent debt. And I can't expect a property manager to have this working knowledge. I can expect a management company to be respectful of the fact that it's complex and they wanna get themselves into a place of excellence by retaining someone with that knowledge base. Be careful, don't you use your own notices and make sure your property management company has an attorney on, not on staff, but has an attorney relationship with an attorney who's doing that type of work in that jurisdiction so you're comfortable and confident that you're getting the type of service that you would expect. Fair housing laws. I can only tell you this. Uh, every month I'm dealing with a, uh, a complaint from uh, a tenant or someone claiming some fair housing violation at the Department of Civil Rights, a claim of discrimination, a claim of uh, lack of um, uh, accommodation for an emotional support animal, a discriminatory decision not to rent to someone. And these are really time consuming, expensive for a client and frustrating. And if in fact you have a property management company where for instance, a prospective applicant says, I have an emotional support animal and your property manager says, I'm sorry, it's an OPETS building. You've created liability for the owner. And sometimes a property management company will have a new employee who is not conversant in the law and they can be dangerous because they don't know what they don't know. And they end up speaking or communicating without knowledge 
And the easy one is, hey, I have an emotional support animal and the tenant uh, or the property manager says, sorry, it's a no pets building. Bingo, you've got liability. The Department of Fair Employment and Housing or the Civil Rights Department will ultimately determine that you violated that tenant's rights and you're likely to have to pay a penalty and also participate in an educational seminar to put yourself and familiar yourself with the law. This can occur whether it's an accommodation request because someone uh, has a physical limitation, someone has a mental disability, an application was glossed over because it was a large family and someone says, I'm sorry, the, the unit is too small for your family. There are so many ways you can create liability for yourself. Your management company has to be careful, smart about communication, and that, cre that requires strategic understanding of the risks involved in the tenant selection process, as well as while you have a tenant, and you have maybe a noise complaint and the person has Tourette's and at night they have uncontrollable screaming and is causing dysfunction inside the building because people are being awoken. There are so many different nuances that I've been exposed to. The most important is that your management company is fully trained to identify where we have rules regarding not discriminating against people, for instance, for instance, because of their sexual orientation, their family, religion, racial identity, all of these different scenarios that you and the management company have to be careful of. And I have one right now, interestingly, with a tenant who ended up being evicted from a property. And even after the trial and the eviction, they filed a fair housing complaint. And we have to deal with the fair housing complaint and it's work and it's expensive and I wish we can avoid it. You will at times face unreasonable accusations that are not truthful. What we wanna do is reduce the risk of accusations that are truthful, that create liability for yourself. And the failure was because the management company was not adept at handling it or you as a housing provider were ignorant of what your rules and regulations are, be advised, and I'll say it again, a summary denial of participation in a Section 8 tenancy creates liability for you. So if someone says, I have a voucher and I'd like to apply for your rental unit, you will respond, we welcome all applicants, please apply. I'll say it one last time. If a prospective applicant says, I have a voucher from Section 8 or from a third party subsidy, I'd like to apply to your unit as a tenant. You don't say, I'm sorry, we don't participate in a third party subsidy program such as Section 8. Instead, you emphasize, I welcome all applicants. I've said it. Clients are being sued, property management companies are being sued, and what we want to do is avoid that risk. Now, choosing what rent to offer for a unit is an art form, part informed by data and part informed by prudence and knowledge. So right now we see these now uh, we see this information that rents in San Francisco have dropped. Uh, rents in Oakland are at a near three-year low, and there's a obvious pressure because of vacancies to reduce the rent. But there's also pressure because of increased mortgage payments, increased costs. That if there's a vacancy, I want to get the highest rent possible, and so that tension of wanting the highest rent while also recognizing that rents are dropping requires a property manager to set the asking rent at an amount that gets you to that sweet spot. Some owners will make a decision that they're gonna keep a unit vacant until they get the highest rent because they're subject to just cause eviction rules and rent regulation. And instead of renting a place for $2,700, they have a vacant unit at $3,000 a month for eight months because the place doesn't rent for 3,000, it rents for 2,650. And they have lost in that six months, 
$18,000 of what they thought the rent would be, but in fact, it's about $15,000 of lost rent and it will take them years to recover that loss. As a property manager, you're to be on a proactive communication with an owner to say, look, I think your expectations are out of whack with reality. Let's set the asking rent at an amount that gets to a sweet spot that is going to attract the largest volume of applicants so that we can select the best qualified applicant. Because if you set that rent at the peak, you may get people who are reaching for that rent because they have asterisks and Achilles heels in their application, such as a prior bankruptcy, such as a prior eviction, or such as some sort of restraining order or something in their past, or they have no landlord references. And they're willing to overpay because they know that they're not attractive. And then you put that person in and you're thrilled you get market rate on it or you got your high rent. And three months down the line, they're not paying the rent. You call me up and you say, Mr. Bornstein, I failed. And I say, you know what? Mistakes are often made. Let's try to fix this as fast and as cheap as possible. Why I tell you that is that this is an art form and we wanna be smart about setting rents. And of course we'd like to get the most rent possible, but we also need to be smart that vacancies create lack of cash flow. And I'd rather have someone come in at a price that meets the market and I have an excellent profile of a tenant than sitting trying to get the highest rent and my profile of that prospective tenant is not ideal. You have a tenant who's reaching for a three unit, three bedroom apartment, and they're gonna pay $4,800 a month and they bring you two people and you're like, really, you two are gonna rent this at $2,400 a month? And they show you that they're high tech entrepreneurs and they've got good cash flow, and they move in and then two months later, you find out that they wanna have roommates because they wanna share the rent. And now you've got yourself the pickle of deciding whether you're going to allow them to have roommates or not. And then the management company has to inform you of what the rules are in San Francisco that you can have up to two people per unit. And all of a sudden you thought you rented to two people and now you've got six people in your unit and there's not much you can do. Those are the pickles that we find ourselves in as an attorney helping and it's those type of things that we can alleviate and try to insulate against when we're selecting tenants at the inception. And it takes a knowledge base of what you can anticipate before you actually jump into a landlord tenant relationship. So be smart about tenant selection and you want a management company that is also smart. And sometimes that's having a heart to heart communication with you informing you that your expectations of rent are out of whack with reality or are too high to attract that quality person or group that you'd love to offer the unit to. Now, when you're looking and searching for a management company, I want you to recognize that sometimes there are covenants in a management agreement that uh, you need to be aware of. You very much want to review that property management agreement carefully. You want to not be quick in signing agreements and you want to look at potentially risk of exorbitant commissions when leases are renewed. For example, a tenant is already a tenant and they decide to renew for a year and all of a sudden you're paying a commission that's not consistent with what would be fair. Uh, you can have management agreements that pay a uh, fee if um, or constrain you in terms of who you choose to sell the property with. And then there are other hidden costs regarding other related services that you don't necessarily need. If you are looking at a management agreement and you have questions, I'm happy to answer those questions and I'm happy to evaluate it but you wanna really hone in and drill down and understand that management agreement so that you don't get heartburn after the fact, after you've executed the agreement, because just like any lease agreement, a property management agreement is a contract where both parties are obligated to comply with the terms of the contract. Now, Using websites, digital tools, marketing the unit, and finding a prospective pool of applicants is a tricky proposition. Some owners simply do not have the time or the propensity to do it, 
and they choose property management companies not to have full service management, but simply to select that ideal candidate and then sign the lease agreement. Whether you have one single family home or thousands of units, we're happy to consider the relationship. I'm happy to guide you in that. And also, whether you work with Bay Property Group or not, I'm happy to talk with you about your current situation and whether you are eligible for management. And I will say this, I have lots of people come to me after having a landlord-tenant dispute and they say to me, Mr. Bornstein, I'm fed up with owning real estate. I want out. And it's not because they're fed up with real estate. They just had a terrible landlord-tenant relationship. And getting out of real estate can create a taxable event that's so enormous that it doesn't make sense for them to get out of real estate. What it makes sense for is for you to have excellent third-party management so that you can go to Europe, go to Mexico, go to Canada, go to Disneyland, and be able to relax knowing that you have 24-7 coverage of your rental unit. And now you're free to be able to intermittently check up on your real estate investment, but not have to be captured by it or held hostage by it. Excellent management allows freedom for you, but your assumption is that it's excellent. And that sometimes is a false assumption, and it requires you to do your work to identify that excellent property management company. And the hope is that you understand this nuance so that you're in a position to make an educated decision about who you affiliate with so that you can free yourself sometimes from the aggravation of being a manager of your own property. When you're in your 60s and you've done this for 30 years and you're ready to do some wonderful traveling and you haven't done so because you think you have to be close to your real estate, well, it may be you don't need to sell your real estate. What you need to do is transition it into third-party management. So with management, remember, what you're really trying to establish is quality cash flow arising out of your real estate investments so that you can pay your bills, that you have natural appreciation in your real estate, and that you're making a profit while also maintaining that real estate physical condition of the building. And that's what we're keen to do for you. If any of you are contemplating management, by all means, please reach out to Ethan at Bay Property Group. Email me if you'd like, Daniel Bornstein. And most importantly, in this process of going through this webinar, you've got an understanding of how I see things, where are the roadblocks, where are the potential risk components, and how I see a real estate relationship with a management company that will create synergy for you and put cash in your pocket and reduce risk and worry. But it requires a selection of a management company that is at minimum staying abreast of the law, that has outstanding communication, that bookkeeping is outstanding so that you can rest assured that you're not actually going downhill in choosing to provide third-party management to your tenants as opposed to you doing it yourself. Final statement, it is better for you to manage your property than to choose a management company that fails you repeatedly because all you're getting is more risk, more aggravation, and out-of-pocket costs that are better used for your own. The hope is that when you do decide to engage in management, that you're getting outstanding management in the process. So with that stated, I wanted to say thank you very much. It's my pleasure to have helped you learn, and it's always my pleasure to be part of your education. I'm Daniel Bornstein. Again, I always am sending out social media updates, e-blast about law, management, real estate, landlord, tenant, and I want you to know that if you are not part of the social media network, you're not part of our affinity group, please do so. Send me your email, and I'll get you email blasts. If you have other people who would like to have this distributed to them, by all means, please do so. It's again, a privilege to educate, and it's my pleasure to have educated and talked to you for now 55 minutes without interruption. Thank you very much. If you do have 
questions, by all means, daniel at bornstein.law. Thank you.